What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to The Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. What is going on? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of the new Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual studio by an amazing man, Dr. Mario Martinez. Uh, Before I tell you guys his illustrious pedigree, let me say, Mario, it's great to have you. How are you? Thank you. My pleasure. It's awesome to have you. I appreciate you being here today. Obviously, the world is in disarray right now, to say the least. Um, So, guys, real quick, Dr. Mario is one of the world's leading. Uh, subject matter experts, um, researchers in understanding blue zones and understanding longevity and aging. And I just recently watched him give a presentation at Dr. Dan Stickler's uh, Appear on Zoy conference three weeks ago, which by the way, Mario, now in the world, seems like it was 10 years ago. And all the- <laughs> it does, yeah. But his, his, his presentation was phenomenal. And I raced over to see him with all the other people that were like attacking him. And I said, you're doing a podcast with me. He didn't know me from Adam. He's like talking to all (laughs) these people. He's like, okay. So he's here now. It's amazing. But um, just real quick, he's a clinical neuropsychologist, founder of biocognitive science. And he's also the author, of course, of bestsellers, The Mind Body Code and The Mind Body Self. Dr. Dan Stickler said, you have to interview Mario. He's truly amazing. And that was before I saw you present. So now with all that said, let me just ask you, what is going on right now um, in the world relative to people aging and people handling this from a uh, stress and cortisol suppressive uh, stance or, or position in your opinion? Well, it depends on, uh, on what culture you're in because uh, what, what I'm doing with science is bringing the, what I call the missing link, which is mind and body, but mind and body communicate in a, in a cultural context. So it depends if you're in the blue zones or in the areas where people are uh, over a hundred and, and, it, and they have a different lifestyle, nothing's going on. Right. It's about the same. They don't, uh, they don't buy into to the things that, uh, that go on. They don't have that, uh, that uh, micromanaging of, of news. And so they have a different uh, lifestyle and that's why they live longer. But what's going on is that we have, we have a media uh, um, world media that has to sell and panic sells a lot faster than any virus or than anything else that's going on. Mario, if it bleeds, it leads. That's right. That's right. So I think that what ha- what's happening with, with aging or growing older, first I'll give you the definition between the two, at, at least how I look at it in my theory. Um, growing older only takes time. That's it. You're a day older than you were yesterday. That's it. Aging is really what you do with time based on your cultural beliefs. Nice. So unfortunately, gerontology studies the pathology of aging. And I study the causes of health of growing older. So it's totally different. Right. And you're told that um, as you grow older, you get weaker and, uh, and you're going to have illnesses and, and things are going to be happening to you. Uh, the family illnesses will eventually come out. And all of these things are statistical averages. They're not the kinds of uh, sentencing that you get, uh, the, uh, the genetic sentencing that you get. So that's what I'll, I'd like to talk about. But in general, the, the, the answer is that it depends on where, where you're coming from. If you're in a place that, is, uh, th- that values youth, but youth not in, in a sense of wellness, but a youth of having to, to look good and, and, and doing all the things that you think you need to do to be healthy, then, then the aging uh, increases, the, the aging uh, negativity increases because what you're doing is totally against what works with the growing older process with, with wellness, which are causes of health. So the way I look at it is that I, I, I believe that longevity is learned. It's culturally learned. And from my work and the work of others, 20% at most, 25% is genetic. The rest is the, what I call the biocultural beliefs and the biocultural ways of living with life. It's not even diets. It's not living 
at the bottom of mountains. It's it, none of that because some people eat a lot of uh, dairies, other people eat a lot of meat, other people are vegetarians. There are very few vegans. Uh, there are a few, but uh, but what happens is that it's not just what they do; it's what I call the causes of health. So, what I'm talking about in my books is that longevity is learned culturally at any age and the causes of health are inherited but they need to be triggered they just don't happen automatically and it all has to do with the immune system and the psychoimmunology of, of of what goes on with a person so i want you to go back to something you just said because it, it piqued my curiosity so you've studied the blue zones you've studied all these different people all over the world men and women and you mentioned that you don't see many vegans who live past 100. What is your theory on that? I think that if you do anything in excess, it, uh, it depletes the system. If you, let's say you, all, you, you eat meat, or you just eat dairy, or only vegetables, uh, then, then it, it doesn't have a balance. And I know that there are supplements and, and all of that, but sure. uh, uh, I think that, that one of the causes of health that I found from vegetarians, uh, from uh, vegetarians and meat eating, um, centenarians is that they are not obsessed with what they do right so for example if you have a a, a centenarian who's a, who's a vegetarian and you invite him over for a barbecue he'll come and he'll eat the meat or she'll eat the meat exactly they don't live based on a rigid fear-based system but based on what they believe is good for them their intuition of course their, their culture and i think that's what 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 makes it uh, work so well so they they have ways of living but with flexibility they have horizons of flexibility rather than rigidity and boundaries wow that's brilliantly summoned in very very short amount of words but I, you know i i would agree with you i think and you're basically leading on with it is that people who practice veganism are so meticulously you know rigid and living within these constraints of oh my god i can't eat that can't eat that, can't eat that, right? Because like even vegans that I know, and as you know, it's become this militant thing now in society with the movie Game Changers and all this stuff. But like when they're at your house or at get family get-togethers, right? They, they have these rules and they have to tell you or, or, or like, you know, because I won't mention names in my family, but I'm, I'm dealing with that. And they'll be like, oh, well, I can't come because so-and-so won't serve vegan dishes. So you're right, you live in the constraints of the autonomic nervous system going up and down, cortisol. You're right, you're right. And, and, uh, and, and very militant, as you said, very militant. I'm not criticizing, I'm just observing. Very militant in the sense that uh, they ha they, you have to adjust to them and they can't participate with you. That's exactly right. You wanna right. offer something, they can't participate with you. And that goes against the causes of health. The causes of health are a way of connecting with people or sharing with people. Um, you, don't, you don't drink wine, but one day you're invited to drink wine, you have a glass of wine, and it's not gonna hurt you. In fact, it's gonna help you because what you're doing is that one of the causes of health is community connection. Right. Uh, breaking bread with family or with friends. Right. Whatever breaking bread there is. Of course, you don't wanna eat a junk food because eventually it'll clog your arteries and everything, but, but I mean, look at uh, Warren Buffett. He drinks Cokes and potato chips. <laughs> He just went to the doctor and the doctor said, you, you're in better shape now than you were four years ago. What is it about him? That he enjoys what he does and he's not attached to things. He has an old car that he drives and he's one of the wealthiest men in the world. Right. He's not pretentious. He's not rigid about anything. And those are examples of the people that I, that I have studied who are in good health and, uh, and enjoy their lives and, and up to the hundreds. And the, the oldest that I interviewed was 107-year-old uh, Zen master in L.A. actually. And um, I asked him, um, what, uh, how, when did your parents die? And he gave me a Zen zinger. He said, my parents die when I die. <laughs> wow, exactly. <laughs> so then I, and then I what, said, what ethnicity, what ethnicity was that guy? Japan, uh, Japanese. Wow. A, a, a Japanese uh, Zen master. And I asked him about his uh, parents' age, and he just didn't, he's like, not important. But then I went to his assistant because I needed to do the anthropology. Sure. And the, uh, and and I she checked it out. The the mother uh, died at seventy five, and the father died at at seventy, and he wow. was one hundred and seven. Wow! So so much for genetics. Now genetics helps, but it's not sufficient. It's it's what you do with your genetics. Exactly, it's, it's epigenetics, right? Epigenetics, that's right. 
And one of the things we want to do now, getting back to the, to the crisis that we're dealing with in the world and the hysteria, is that you don't want to pass it on epigenetically, meaning, as you know, that I'll explain it to the public, that whatever, whatever you learn, whatever you do, not only are you putting it into your gene expression, but you're passing it on to another generation. An example of uh, people who were in Auschwitz and Dachau and other concentration camps during World War II, for the next two or three generations, their offsprings have higher cortisol levels than the normal people. And it takes about two or three, four generations to get rid of it. So Mario, that is so amazing that you say that because in one of the books that I've been reading and Monica, my wife, who you met, who's there too, you know, we, 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 know, we learn about transgenerational trauma. Yes. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And this is, you know, they talk about the sins of the father. Yes. I mean, it's, it's literally, that's what you're talking about. This is literally passed across um, DNA. Yes, because before it was thought that, that the genetics is just, uh, it takes millions of years for, for genes to change and, and, and that, the, uh, that the intelligence was in the uh, nucleus and, and, and it's not like that at all. The intelligence is the edge on the, on the membrane and the information that the environment uh, gives you, which was unheard of before, before epigenetics, has an effect on your, on your gene expression and the, and the offspring's gene expression. So that's bad news. And the good news is that you can change things by the environmental things that you do. Environmental, including self, because it's a, we're an ecology, we're a walking ecology. Right. So right now, to that point, if you're a parent, you have to be, you have to be calm and maintain a sense of serenity about you around your children right now, right? Because you're basically attaching that response mechanism to them they're they're seeing that behavior and that patterning in they're just going to imbibe that <laughs> it's incredible yes and and for example now that uh, people are quarantined and they're uh, the children are at home and right and the parents are at home then you have to change the archetype you can't get into the modern archetype of, uh, of what you usually do going to restaurants what you do is you go back to the caves right. and back to the forest and it's in our DNA. It is in our expression, for example, candles or fire was very important. We, in, in the cave days and in the forest times, because not everybody lived in caves, um, they lived around the fire and the fire protected them. And it had a lot of uh, value in cooking and, and, and the family gathering. By the way, that's one of the causes of health. So what do you do now? You begin to eat with candles, with family. Right. And you begin to have rituals that are with a family and, and teaching with a family. So what it does is it increases your, your wellness by doing those things. But if you do it in isolation and you want to impose one archetype on the other, the hypervigilant archetype, the one who lives in the urgent present, then it won't work. You'll be climbing the walls. Archetypes need to be changed to the conditions. Yeah. If you don't, then what happens is it's like trying to uh, hammer something with, uh, with the back of a screwdriver. It doesn't work. Right, right. Wow, wow. So there's so much that's really coming out of this time, you know, however long it may or may not continue on where we can learn from these things. And your, your research is, wow. I mean, <laughs> kind of startled just thinking about like how we're all reacting right now under quarantine and under these, you know, construct constricted conditions. Um, talk a little bit about um, what, what you phrase or classify as healthy longevity. Um, what I, what I tried to do was to, study centenarians that were healthy. I wasn't interested in centenarians who were in, in, in nursing homes, just or vegetables. Bees. Yeah. That, that's not, uh, so the healthy longevity is people that, that, are, that are cognitively in good shape, that are ba basically mostly healthy, uh, that even if they have a chronic illness is under control. Some of them live alone, some of them live in families, some, some of them live in, in, uh, in nursing homes, but very few. And if they do live in nursing homes, they're the, the rock stars of the nursing home. Right. Uh, and what, what I found about them is that they, they really believe that everybody loves them. That's another cause of health. And that sounds very narcissistic because you think, oh, everybody loves me. But what they do, and this is what I talked about in, in, at the conference at the Payron, yeah. is that they have what I call inclusive narcissism, healthy inclusive narcissism, which means that they think that everybody loves them, but they love back. A, a narcissist or a sociopath will use people's love to manipulate them. What they do is they, they co-author the love with other people. And the, right. the, the one that I mentioned that I told you when I went to, to Cuba, um, this man was, uh, um, we, they had a little party for him after I interviewed him and talked to him, and he was 102. 
<laughs> and there were women and there were people, that, and he comes up to me and he says, did you notice how the women are looking at me? <laughs> they're in love with me. And I say, yes, they are. You're, they're looking at it. But then here's the inclusive. He said, but look how beautiful they are. They're all beautiful. Right. See, that's the spread of love. And that is a powerful cause of health. And the important thing is that the, the psychoneurology of it is that it doesn't matter how many people love you. You have to believe that you're being loved. Otherwise, right. it doesn't go in. Absolutely. Look at the rock stars that commit suicide and they, they, they overdose. Because even though they have millions of people that adore them, they don't believe worthiness or they don't believe that they're adored. And you could have somebody in a cave who thinks that everybody loves them. And the uh, value of the love, the compassion and the things begin to increase all kinds of antibodies and right. uh, endorphins and uh, all kinds of things that are right. really uh, immune enhancers. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I agree. I, am, I, I agree 100,000%. You know, I, my wife and I say this all the time, and I, whenever I speak or whenever I talk to people, I say that until you can love and trust yourself assuredly, you really can't even give love or even receive love from other people because you don't have that self love. And that is exactly what you're basically saying. And so these people truly understand, and I know you are familiar with this, but you know, the, the, the terminology from the Miso American indigenous is Ani, right? A Y N I. And that is the mm-hmm. divine reverence and love of all things, the sacred, conscious, sentient, you know, uh, worshiper or, or understanding of that everything is sentient, everything is alive, everything has awareness. And so you have that equal uh, conjoined love for all of those things. And, and, you know, to, to put it in blunt practice, it's like you don't step on uh, insects. Yeah. You know, you're not killing things indiscriminately. Uh, when you're in nature, you speak to the trees, you know, you hear the, the, obviously the, you know, the old school tree huggers, but I mean, go up and hug a tree, love a tree, give the energy back. The tree is providing oxygen and CO2. I mean, it just, it really does make so much more sense that when you do have uh, an understanding that you do love and trust yourself, you are able to receive and also, of course, give it out versus someone who doesn't. Yes. And I think, and again, as you said, it's the belief system. For example, I don't believe that the universe gives you anything. I mean, you don't go and the universe has your back. I don't believe in that because the universe is very busy expanding and it's not gonna stop to get your new car or a new girlfriend or boyfriend. Exactly. But what happens though, if you believe that, that connectiveness that you believe is actually enhancing. Yes. And and, and it's it's wellness. Right. So even if there's nothing going on there and you believe it, it's the same as if it were going on. It's so true. You know, the, the quantum, you know, teaches us that the universe, exactly as you just said, does not define things as good as bad. It, 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 it gives what is focused upon. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so that's exactly what you get. It's exactly what you reality, said, how yeah. you act. Yes. Yes. Amazing. Literally amazing. Um, I mean, there's so many things I could talk to you about. Um, so, so the biosymbolic brain and the immune system. Okay. Um, the, the best way to describe that, and you know that I try to take things and make them very down to earth and simple and, and operational, is that first, w- what I do is I, I bring culture to psychoneuroimmunology, which was, right. was lacking culture. But defining culture the way that I do for in my purpose is the collective beliefs of all things that are important, like aesthetics, ethics, wellness, longevity, illness, all the things that are important collective beliefs that that's a culture and the culture will teach you to see the world based on that culture so if you look at the world and you say okay the world is out there the world is out there first to be interpreted with whatever equipment you have if you're a human being from uh, you go from infrared to uh, ultraviolet that's it that's all you can see but if you're a bee all you see is ultraviolet so that's the first thing that you have a uh, and if you if you're a snake you see infrared so we have the equipment, but we are the only animal that has a culture in addition to that, a, a cognitive understanding and collective beliefs that animals don't have. They, they do things reflexively and by observation, but not like we do. Right. So then the best way to explain it is that the world is an infinite possibility of interpretations. And then the culture, what the culture does is it weaves a fabric around that world And what the brain will will do is it will look at the fabric and learn from the fabric. So it becomes a cultural brain. And since the immune system responds with brain and so forth, the immune system also has to become cultural. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, 
there's there's so much to be learned about the things that you're studying. Um, what 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 do you find most fascinating when you find a hundred you know a, a centenarian um, who is living alone? you know, by themselves completely in isolation, like what, what are traits that you find about them that make them fascinating to you, you know, and that they can be independent? Because I mean, again, we're talking about a person over the age of a hundred. I mean, do these, yeah. do these, do you find that they have um, family members or social support groups or people in their life that keep them really, really close? Or is it just, do they have a connection with like other elders around them? And what, what, what is the separator for you? Well, they have both, but I think the most important uh, uh, component is that, and, and usually these complex questions can be answered with the way they respond to my questions to them. And, I, and he said to me, um, one of them, it's about 100, 101, I can't remember. He said, if you don't feel comfortable with yourself, you're in bad company. Wow. So you have to do some work on that. So they're very comfortable with themselves. They're very comfortable with other people. And one of the things that I talk about is belongingness. Belongingness, we misinterpret belongingness as meaning that you have to belong with somebody, you have to belong with something. <laughs> yeah, like fraternity or sorority or, or a job or whatever, right. or a partnership. Belongingness is really permission to be where you are. Exactly. And if you give yourself permission to be where you are, wherever you are, you have belongingness, whether you're with somebody or by yourself. And that they do automatically. So my theory is based on what they do automatically and what they do uh, just a, as, a, as a way of living. And I had to create a whole theory about it to be able to explain what they do. So that belongingness is very important to them. They're not antisocial, but they don't have to be with somebody all the time. And they also have great losses in their lives, even their children. One of them told me a joke. That's another thing. They have a great sense of humor. Of course. He said, uh, you know, they, they're, they're two centenarians that, that go to the, to the uh, marriage counselor and they say, doctor, we want a divorce. And the doctor said, a divorce? How long have we been together? And uh, they said, well, well, we've been together for 70 years. And why would you want to do that? I mean, why don't you just stay together and, and be kind and love each other and all that? And, and then the wife said, no, no, look, we've been thinking about this for quite a while. And we decided that we were going to do it after the children died. <laughs> <laughs> it's bizarre. But at the same time, that is amazing. <laughs> yeah, there will be no trauma to the kids. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So what they do, though, is two things. And, and um, they two things that I think are important, especially in relationships. Two things happen. They have losses and they have unrequited love in their lives. People that, that didn't want to be with them. And I think that by looking at them, what I found is that for your losses, the way to deal with your losses without dying with them is to celebrate having known them. Wow. That's the antidote. Yes. The, the way to deal with your unrequited love without getting sick or depressed, and you, you could get down a little bit without really developing a major illness, which some people do, you have to put faith on your journey. Right. So those two are, are very, very important. One of them um, uh, said that, that every Valentine, he toasts to all his unrequited love for having the good sense of saying no to him. <laughs> So you see, they're packed with wisdom. So what, what do they, when, when you ask them, because I know you do, when you ask them about death, what, what is their response when they talk about death? Because I would guess that a person who has lived and defeated it for so long, technically, you know, the physical uh, expiration, um, is just looks at it as just a change of focus, right? Like it's just a part of the natural, the natural ebb and flow. I mean, but I don't know. I'm asking you. Yeah, no, they, they don't fear death. They, uh, but, but the thing about it is, the interesting thing is that I used to think, well, all of the things that they're doing is to live long. And that's not at all. They're, 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 what they're doing is to really enjoy what they do. And when it's time to go, they go. They go very right. peacefully. You go to some of the nursing homes when the centenarians die and they go very peacefully. But also, interestingly, they think they have all the time in the world. They, they know how to elongate time. And curiosity elongates time. Right. There was a, a myth also, I'd love to, to, to tear up myths, where they tell you, the gerontologists, some of them will say, um, as you grow older, you begin to perceive have, having less and less time, because you do. And, and then that causes a lot of stress. It's not true. Yeah. Why? They don't have that problem. And the reason is that there's a lot of work now in the perception of time, 
And if you have curiosity up, then the elongation of time continues. And the reason that happens if you don't do that is that what they call in the, the, the first first uh, from uh, up to your 30s, you have your first love, your first making love, your first broken heart, your first job, your first, the first, 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 and the first create a lot of uh, curiosity. But what happens is that the centenarians continue to have first and first and first because they're extremely curious. They have a high level of novelty learning. And that's what allows them to have the, the, uh, the elongation of time. So if you want to have the elongation of time independent of your age, get curious about the world and about right. yourself and about everything else. And, and it elongates. So then they feel they have all the time in the world, but if they die tomorrow, that's it. That was it. That's the journey. Amazing. I mean, and you know, and you know this because this is where we're at in society now, but like think about how much technology is killing creativity and curiosity. Yeah, yeah. Two kids uh, talking to each other 10 feet away, they're texting each other. Exactly. Instead of, uh, you know, I call it the, uh, uh, the digital uh, telegraph. Uh, because it's it, and it's no longer connecting with people, and it allows you to create what I call the, the I self. The I self is all based on the information that you used to share with people. Now you share it through a uh, uh, some kind of digital process. It's and insane. the worst thing that a person can do is eat while they have their phone or they have their laptop or whatever, because that that is a way of learning uh, gastritis and, and and gastrointestinal problems. I can't even imagine how many people are literally doing that. Well, to your point, though, that what you just said, then maybe if we look at this self-quarantining, this isolation, this social distancing, whatever nonsense they come up with, it's a chance for us to reinvigorate our relationships with our families and our children and to dis distance ourselves from, from this shit. That's right. You know, from technology. And if people would look at that from a, that perceptual awareness, instead of, like you just said, you know, the social, te the telegraph, the digital telegraph, and then the expression all over the place of like how they're feeling instead of doing it with human beings. My God, imagine how much greater a, a, the advancement of our vibration as a species, Mario. Oh, of course. And, and, and I think that what happens is we have learned the I self is very external, but when you have to go inward, then you have to become internal, introspective, curious. So you can't do it with the I self. The I self was not made for being uh, at home uh, quarantined or for being right. at home. It, it was made for the externality, externality. Uh, but look what's happening in Venice. It's, you go, you look at pictures of Venice, the, the uh, canals of, of, of Venice, they're pristine. They're, they're cleaning clean, up. They're beautiful. Yeah. What needs to happen is that, what did we learn from this? And let's be very careful keeping them clean. What will happen, unfortunately, is that within six months, it'll be back to a, a, a trash can. So one suggestion that I make is during this, what are you going to take with you after the crisis is over? Because it will be over. Uh, we've had hundreds of thousands of years of, of um, viruses and all kinds of things. And guess what? We're still here. Yeah. We're, 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 we're uh, uh, how, how would you say it? We're a very resistant species. <laughs> very much. Yeah. Like, like cockroaches. <laughs> um, okay. So there was one last, a couple of that last thing, but a couple other things I would have talked about was living beyond the tribal pale. And then the, uh, you know, you also said you're, you're a, pro a proponent of cultural psycho neuroimmunology. I wanted you to talk about both of those. Okay. Yeah. Be, um, in, in biocognition, we invite people to go beyond the pale and beyond the pale. Look how, how hard it is to deal with because it has a negative connotation. They'll say she went beyond the pale, meaning that that just went too far. Beyond the pale that I'm talking about is getting away from the collectivism that you learn. Right. And you have to individuate, like Jung said, and I call it a, a becomingness. Right. But once you try to do the becomingness, it's no longer serving the collectivism of the tribe. And the tribe will then wound you with uh, abandonment, betrayal, or, um, or shame. So that's what needs to happen. The individuation needs to happen. And since we're social beings, you need to find a subculture that supports your individuation. Because the, old, the tribe will not support it. The tribe wants you to fail and come back, not consciously, uh, but they want you to come back and, uh, well, see, you couldn't make it. I do a lot of work with uh, country music stars, and, uh, and some of them come from very humble backgrounds. And when they go back at first, they're, they're stars and beautiful. Then after a while, oh, so you don't have any time for us. You don't have any time. One of them that I worked with came to see me after he failed, with, with, lost a major contract, and he became, a, quote, an alcoholic. And he went back home and they loved him. Okay, you see, we told you that that the death was in Nashville. Grab we'll take him. care of you. 
Yep. He yep. decided that intuitively that that wasn't just very healthy. And we started working and uh, he came back and got another contract, drank socially. And then he, when he went back, then he had a, uh, a way of dialoguing with people like that. He said, look, when you go back, make sure that you go back for a period of time that you're not going to be toxified. Right. And when they give you their dialogue, then you have to give them a different dialogue. So the dialogue was, uh, oh, so here you are. You made it again and you, you're not coming. You haven't seen us in a while. <laughs> and then the dialogue was, how long is it that I haven't seen you? And they'll say, two months. I'm so amazed at the way you keep time. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I got to do that with my family. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm and the and they don't like it. But then, and they'll say, uh, so I'll say, no, I called you because I really want to spend some time with you. Well, I'm very angry with you. Hey, that's no problem. <laughs> when you're not angry. I'm very angry with you. I'm very angry with you. <laughs> yeah, very angry with you. So I'll call you when not angry. Um, so uh, why haven't you called me? Oh, look, I just want to praise the keeping of time that you have. Why I haven't called you? I don't know. But we're here now. What do you want from me now? Oh, I don't want anything. I just want you to, to, to take more time. Well, no, you're the timekeeper. That's up to you. <laughs> you see? So you don't let them toxify you. It's totally a redirect. That's beautiful. That's right. Completely. And they don't have any software to deal with that. So they have to acquiesce or just hang up. Why see, is it? I, I, you don't want to get toxified. This is such amazing advice, you know, because it, 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 I think it explains a lot of our lives and especially the more creative and curious and independent and, um, you know, introspective and entrepreneurial you are, the less you are going to be around those type of people. So this is, you know, very prescient, prescient advice for that type of situation. For me, I just avoid them. Like, I, I oh, don't, yeah, I mean, I don't even care. Like, you know, I'm not even going to get into that conversation, but that if you do get into the conversation, that's exactly yeah. the way to do it. That's what you do. Yeah. With family, you can do that. But I think what, what's happening is that you never want to over-inform. Right. Because you went, when you over-inform, they're better at being toxic than you are. So if you say, well, I haven't called you because I've been very busy. Oh, so you've been very busy. You're not busy enough for me. And, and you know, so you never explain it. No, I just love the way you keep time. I want you to, any time that I call you, to tell me exactly how long it's been since we talked. That is so beautiful. Uh, so that, that takes care of that. Um, never over-inform. There's a tendency. To, and in fact, when you over-inform, people believe you less. Yeah. It's absolutely true. And that, and that it's funny because like in the world that we're in right now for people that really are hyper aware and understanding of what's their interpretation of things, you shouldn't share it with people who are less informed or, you know, in fear because you're right. They will literally, it's a vibrational thing. It's the whole like, you know, down here versus up here. It's a repelling. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, um, and, and the other question you had about psychoneurmonology, um, my mentor, George Sullivan was the one who created he called it psychoimmunology at first because he found that psychological processes affect the immune system with people who, are, who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis and so forth. Then later, Bob Ader found that the nervous system, and he called it psychoneuroimmunology. Then uh, uh, Besadowski, a, he's a, um, an Argentinian um, endocrinologist, lives in, in Switzerland. He found that the um, hormones, also the endocrine system, they call it psychoneuroimmunoendocrinology. But what's happening is that they're doing all these things, and what it's a it's a multidisciplinary um, um, uh, inquiry in, into uh, into the, the person that actually studies how cognition and emotions affect the regulation of the nervous, immune, and endocrine system. Wow! But what I'm bringing in now is the cultural component because they were doing it free of culture, right? Assuming that it's the same and it's not the you same. You can't do that, no. Uh, so, for example, if you if you shame somebody. Look how, how uh, biocultural the immune system is. If I say something to you, which is words, and I say, you're so stupid, and especially in front of people, you're going to secrete molecules that cause inflammation. Right. Which can, inflammation is affect, affecting every illness from, from depression to cancer. It's all, it's, that's by the way, all disease origin and ideology is from inflammation. Inflammation. But now, if you go to a, an Asian country, which is collectivist, the shaming comes only when they believe that you have shamed their family, their group, their country, Amazing. but not the individual. Amazing. So the immune system is waiting to make the interpretation based on what the culture tells them. So then realistically, even the person shaming, both people are receiving the same molecules. The, the inflammation is coming from both because even when you're criticizing someone, you're doing the same thing to yourself. Yeah, yeah that's right. The, 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 
the psychoneurology doesn't know the difference. No. So if you're being toxic with someone, you're toxifying yourself as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. And it's all vibration. Everything is the universal mirror. What you put out is what comes back. And, and, and without thinking that uh, you're not immune to what you're putting out. So true, man. So true. I mean, it's, it, God, this is so beautiful, man. Um, okay. So, I mean, I could ask you questions all day, but for purposes of keeping this to where the average human attention span will watch this and <laughs> learn from this, what's the best way for people can, uh, c- to connect with you, to reach out to you? I mean, obviously your website is biocognitive.com, but is there anything specific that you would have them read about you or find out about you to come before they connect with you? Yes, uh, there's a lot on the internet. You can just look at uh, uh, Dr. Mario Martinez, Biocognitive Science, or I have a page that, that I keep up with uh, all kinds of information with um, videos, and, and it's free. It's, it's Facebook, and it's after facebook.com uh, forward slash mind body culture. That's it, mind body culture. And you go to Dr. Mario Martinez, and all kinds of information uh, about uh, these things that I'm talking about, um, videos, um, some kind of uh, short articles that I have. So it's quite a bit there. And I, I wrote an article that's really important. I think you may have it about the coronavirus. Yeah, the medium one. Yeah, I shared it with my-, my uh, Good, my good, because that, that's really and, giving information on what's going on, but also what can you do about it? Yeah, no, it's beautiful. And, and when this podcast runs, I'll, I'll make sure that it's linked to it. Uh, Mario, I have huge gratitude for you coming on today. I mean, I, my I mean pleasure. Again, it was 42 minutes, but it was just so profound. I mean, I- I messaged my wife as I was talking to you. I sent him a screenshot. I said, I'm talking to you right now because she was really moved by your lecture. And I was like, oh my God, you're going to be more moved when well, you watch the podcast. I was just like texting her. Say hi to her. You, you made it very easy for me. Oh, well, I, I mean, again, I appreciate you. The, it, my gift is bringing out the best in other people. So, I mean, it's just an honor to have you with me. I mean, Dan, Dan told me, he's like, dude, you got to have him on. But uh, thank I'm you so much. Going, I'm definitely going to push your Facebook um, community. Um, towards a lot of people and obviously recommend people buy your book. But, you know, again, my, my heart's open. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming. Thank on. you. My pleasure. And congratulations on the work you're doing. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. So for everybody, again, support, uh, support the amazing people that come on the show. Please go to his Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash mind, body, culture. You can also find him at www.biocognitive.com. Dot com. Um, let me just say again, thank you so much, Mario, for coming on. And remember, everybody, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys soon.